yeah, lots of learning, uh, inspiration also. Um, but I would say one of the important factors uh, in all this, uh, in trajectory like this, is motivation. Um, I've always been motivated to try to understand things, how things work, um, asking the why questions. And um, and uh, at some point in uh, my uh, beginning of grad studies, um, I was looking for topics that I, I could work on. And I started reading about um, connectionist models. So the, this is a term used for the early work on neural networks um, that was inspired by cognitive science, neuroscience, and applied to build learning machines, uh, like the work of Jeff Hinton, for example. And, um, and I got very excited, um, and I'm still excited. So yeah, it's, uh, if, if you're doing work in an area that you don't feel a strong uh, emotional kind of uh, appeal, then it's not I'm going to be the same as if you you're passionate about it. Um, so the reason I was passionate about it is because I thought that um, this. Well, I was interested in the notion of intelligence before, um, and <clears throat> I thought that this could help us both understand our intelligence and animal intelligence, and build intelligent machines, um, which which was uh, something I hadn't really thought about as even possible. And that there could be fairly understandable principles like laws of physics, and that could help us understand how intelligence emerges and what you know what it really means and how it can be achieved. So, so that's uh, so basically I, I tell you this story because it's about motivation and what happens to be motivating me. But different scientists uh, can be motivated by very different things. Um, uh, other Another important factor, I think, along this trajectory is collaboration. Um, there's this kind of incorrect picture of how science happens that you can see in movies uh, where scientists, you know, uh, like geniuses and they discover amazing things by themselves uh, in, in their garage or their hidden, uh, you know, a mountain. And it's not how science works. Um, science is really about building on other people's ideas and doing it in groups. Uh, I, I'm very stimulated by the discussions I can have with other scientists, my own students, collaborators. Uh, uh, these discussions, the, the brainstorming, the uh, insights that we get from each other's understanding, that's very powerful. And, um, you know, if I was just doing my thing alone, I, I don't think uh, I would have uh, achieved what I have achieved. And there is a motivation aspect to this. So it's not only like an intellectual thing, but when we're together trying to understand something, uh, trying to figure out something, um, we are motivated by the energy of the others. Like we want to um find solutions to problems because we know tomorrow we're going to be talking to that person and so it, it it kind of forces us to think about this um we want to, we want to please others we want to um uh, you know we we have natural instincts that push us to socialize and to look good in the eyes of others and um and so uh, we also ha take others as as models, right? So especially when you're younger, and and all of these social human factors of you know, the collaboration really make a difference. Okay, so that's number two. Um, what else? So another lesson of my trajectory is persistence and believing in your. Idea, but there's a, a fine line. So, as, you, as maybe some of your readers know, uh, there has been a period in which the kind of work I was doing with neural networks was not very popular in the scientific community, and very few people continue to work on it. And uh, it, you know, I had a hard time even convincing my students to continue working on this. Um, but I had a strong intuition and uh, you know reasons to believe 
that this would, was worth continuing and pushing and that there was something missing in the what was trendy at that time. Um, so the, the lesson here, and of course, it, 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 you know, that's, that's, that bet has, has worked out, right? Um, so the, the, because of, again, because of social factors, people tend to do the same thing as others are doing. So there's, you know, there are trends in science, there are schools of thought, and, um, and that could hurt scientific research because research is an exploration. So we need different people to look in different directions. This is how we can be collectively the most efficient. Uh, now there's, you know, there's exploration and there's wasting your time. And where's the line between two is not obvious. You have to reason, you have to be rigorous, uh, not to fool yourself into some kind of delusional ideas. Um, so being rational here is very important to avoid that. But, <clears throat> But still, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about what is right, like what is the good path to find solutions to problems. And, and so that leaves a lot of room for exploration that is, you know, worthwhile. But, but um, you have to fight that instinct to just go with the flow of what others are doing in order to really um, explore new territories that may contain really exciting, new and useful ideas and knowledge so so that's uh, lesson number three i would say uh, this uh, ability to both listen to your inner voice but be present so you you know yourself uh kind of connected to this I'd say number four is uh and this becomes important also for people like me who get a lot of social recognition which is to try to not be um, um, let's say a uh, blinded by your ego. Uh, so, uh, for example, if, if, you know, you may believe in something, even though there is evidence that it's wrong, but because you, you feel very sure of yourself and you have a strong ego and people tell you that you're good, you continue doing it. And that's, you know, doing it for the wrong reasons. Um, a scientist to be successful needs to, as much as possible, brush, brush aside their ego because um, it, it, you know, it, it, it gives us blinders. It, it makes us think that we are right when we get wrong. Uh, have to uh, sense self out and humility in order to be successful. And I'm not saying like I'm, I'm 100% on this. It's something you have to improve and renew every day. Uh, so that sense of humility um, is is something that needs to be cultivated. So that's that's. Uh, I think I'll stop here for the lessons. There are probably others, but. Uh, made lots of progress, obviously. Um, what's interesting is that some of the principles that people like Jeff Hinton and, and other like uh, not, and many others in the eighties were going uh, still, um, you know, uh, are there. Uh, and uh, we've built on that. We've added a lot of things we didn't know or didn't understand. Uh, I've learned a lot along both years and the community has learned. Um, so, and some of these principles from the early days, um, like the notion of uh, one of the notions that I find most uh, fascinating and that has uh, driven a lot of my progress, in my own research, is that of um, distributed representation. So, so what it means is that uh, a concept is not uh, just represented by a symbol, but it has a representation, uh, which is a rich pattern of activation in the brain, for example, or an item of vector. And uh, is is powerful because it uses a notion of semantics of meaning, and that allows to say that you know cats and dogs have something in common, um, just because of their representation. So it. It allows generalization. It's still at the heart of what we do. 
in computer vision, natural language. But okay, so that's one example. Um, other examples is the use of simple uh, gradient-based optimization that people started exploring uh, again in the late 80s and still it, well, I thought in those days and people thought that we would find much better optimization methods because we knew that gradient descent was simple and stupid. But still kind of uh, the state of the art with some minor adjustments that, that people use. Uh, uh, in, uh, some of the things have changed um, really uh, qualitatively what we can do with neural nets in deep learning um, is of course the uh, exponential improvement in uh, the size of data sets and uh, compute power right so without these two things which we didn't have in say 1990 um, you're limited and you can do with the net. Yeah. So that's, that's very important. And uh, it's, it is going to continue to grow, especially on the computation power side, because there's a lot of industrial investments to build more efficient neural nets. Um, other things that have changed radically, for example, in the nineties, um, you know, my colleagues and I were focused, um, well, at least not everyone, but a lot of people were focused on neural nets used in supervised learning setup where you're doing things like object recognition. And this is an important problem to solve. But in the 2000s uh, and, the, uh, and the teens of this century, um, I and others, uh, in particular, you know, Jeff Young and I, uh, started focusing on unsupervised learning or what Jan likes to call self self about um, human provided labels we're able to use machine learning to discover interesting representations that can be used for tasks downstream um, so that has been a big change in my own view of things and it's still my focus right now to really build machines that can autonomously understand the world through interactions and, and, and building of representations. Um, so, so that was a big thing. And it was really like in the, in the beginning of that century that it changed. Another big thing that was part of my trajectory is the introduction of attention mechanisms. So this came in the work we did around 2014, 2015 on, um, machine translation. Um, so we introduced some, some concepts that are common in neuroscience and cognitive science about attention. Um, and, and where instead of just processing the whole imp or the slave as a, you know, chunk, um, uh, we have mechanisms that focus on a few elements of the input or of the previous layer. And, and this is what attention is about. Uh, and of course, this has become extremely powerful uh, with transformers that came up in uh, 2017 um, and that now uh, are used everywhere, especially in natural language processing, are very, very powerful. So attention really completely changed the type of architecture that we are building in deep learning. So that's fairly recent, right? It's five years old. Um, but, but it's it's changing game, and some of my current work is pushing that envelope even more because there's there's a lot that we don't exploit about human cognition, you know, attention, working memory um, that could be brought into deep learning to make machines pure in a way that is more like the humans reason. And so uh, attention is related to reasoning. The way humans reason is by focusing on a few elements, a few pieces of knowledge, and combining them on the fly to come up with guesses, conclusions, um, um, you know, plans, and so on. So, yeah. Um, oh, there is one important element in the trajectory of uh, concepts, let's say that, uh, the, the, you know, the the... the the phrase deep learning came uh, around 2005 or something, okay. uh, or, you know, we started with the deep 
architectures and so on. I had a paper in 2006 at Neurips uh, with Deep in there. And, and, and uh, the same year, Jeff had several papers with, with those words. Um, and uh, we, we were not supposed to train neural nets with more than one or two layers. Like we, we, when you tried it, we failed. And then what happened around those around 2005 is we started to see how we could train neural nets with many more layers. And it turns out there, you know, lots of theory, including some I worked on, but but of course lots of empirical evidence that neural nets with many layers of composition um, can represent much richer functions, and and that that happens to be very useful to solve more complex problems. Um, and so that that gave the name to deep learning. But it's still neural nets. It's just that we now are able to train them in a way that uh, um, can capture more interesting, more complex phenomena. Yeah. Well, both of these things. Um, so <clears throat> there is a lot of data, but not any data we would like. Right. So uh, there's a lot of text. There's a lot of images. Um, but if you are trying to solve a particular problem, say in medicine, um, you may not have access to enough data about a particular phenomenon you're interested in. And that's very common. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that humans seem to be really good at, uh, you know, dealing with the scarcity of data on a new task. So there's a lot of work in machine learning, including work of Elon with learning. And some of the work we've done in, uh, uh, in general in supervised learning, um, and you know things like meta learning, to which I also you know contributed uh, very early on, um, and multitask learning, transfer learning, continual learning. So these are all different aspects of the problem of how do we uh, go from some information about different tasks or different environments and be able to do well on a new environment or a new task for which there's very little data. Um, uh, the, 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 the angle that I'm currently exploring that's related to this is a causal machine learning where we introduce notions of causality in, in our neural nets. That's very exciting too. Now, going back to the other like side of the spectrum, uh, like things like large language models, you know, people talk about GPT chat these days because they prep. Um, large language models, in order to be as competent as they look like, um, need to be trained on huge quantities of text, or if it's text and image, if they manipulate images. Um, and I, you know, I've been told I'm an expert because these things are happening in companies that we've pretty much exhausted the amount of data, text uh, data that is available on the internet. So in other words, the current large language models are trained on everything that is available. Uh, now, of course, the amount of text that humans produce is going to continue to increase. But, it, you know, we've sort of reached a, a limit and it's a, a further growth in terms of data set size for language. Is, is is kind of limited, uh, but yet these these systems don't do as well as humans in many aspects. Uh, so I think it's interesting to ask ourselves: so, so what is missing? So they train also the amount of data that these systems are trained on is like if a person was reading every day, every waking hour, all their life and then lived a thousand lives or something like this. This is the order of magnitude of data that these systems need to get the confidence that they have. And of course, a four-year-old is able to answer reasoning questions that these machines fail on. Uh, of course, these machines know so much more than a four-year-old or even than any you know, normal human because they're, they're like encyclopedic. They've, they've read everything, but they don't understand it as deeply as we do. Uh, and they're not able to reason with that knowledge as sort of consistently as humans are able to. So my belief is that, yes, more data is better, bigger networks is better, but we're still missing some important uh, ingredients 
to uh, achieve the kind of uh, intelligence that humans have. I would say it started about a decade ago. Uh, so what happened about 10 years ago is the things we were doing with deep learning in our labs suddenly got uh, a lot of attention by tech companies uh, like Google, and Facebook, and Microsoft, and IBM, and um, and so I started realizing that what we're doing was going to be used in the real world, and and and, um, and started thinking about what you know it's going to. Happen. Uh, as with better systems, I mean, it was it a gradual kind of realization. And actually, I started getting scared that as we build more and more powerful machines, more and more powerful tools, they could be used um, in, um, in ways that are socially bad, that are bad for society, maybe bad for the environment, maybe maybe bad for, for social justice, uh, you know. Uh, issues of discrimination, for example, that you mentioned. Um, and actually, the first uh, one of the first topics on which I, I focused was the use of computer vision in um, in the military in uh, you know what's called killer robots. You know, in, in probably these things already exist now. It's not official, but you know, uh, uh, there's some evidence that there are drones that can use uh, AI, you know, to uh, identify target people and then kill them. And of course, from a scientific point of view, we kind of know how to build such machines now. Now it's very scary. So that was one of the things I got involved in, you know, in discussions and, and signing letters and raising the alarm. Um, then, uh, um, uh, then, then lots of people started talking about these issues around uh, like six years ago. Um, and I started discussing these these questions with philosophers, social scientists. So this, this opened my mind quite a lot uh, because, you know, I come with my baggage of a computer scientist and the ways of thinking and uh, the, the, the scholars in the social sciences um, they they really bring a different perspective on things. So they they are thinking about society a lot, about human psychology. You know, and maybe the effect of people. What could go wrong? Uh, so, uh, you know, lots of discussions started to which I was a part of, and um, this led to work in uh, 2016, in particular, on what's called the Montreal Declaration or a responsible development of AI. So I was involved in that. This was something um, uh, uh, happening in Quebec, uh, in Canada, uh, with uh, uh, scholars from many different disciplines. So we had a lot of colleagues you know, on the AI side, but, uh, but many, many people um, in uh, you know, philosophy, uh, legal um, uh, uh, training, uh, sociology, and so on. Uh, discussing all of these questions and then trying to come up with a set of guiding principles for the future development of AI so that it will be aligned as best as possible to our values, our humanist values and to the interests of society at large, of, of humanity. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so this was... I think published in 2017, and, um, and 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 since then there's been I think a couple of hundred of such similar declarations from all around the world. Um, so yeah, it's been a very active field. So but now okay, now making principles is nice. But the next step is actually having governments uh, enact legislation. So I got involved a little bit in that. It's not really my field, but. Uh, I think this is really important, and uh, this uh, Europe has been leader in this. Um, and but now, you know, Canada and in the U.S. are thinking like building up their own legislation in this area. I think it's just the early steps. Uh, we can need a lot more um, regulation 
and legislation to make sure that those tools we're building are going to be working for us uh, and not just the few that have money, but uh, all of us, right? Yeah. Um, also, in 2016, 2017, we created, we, I mean, we, uh, we started working with governments to create Mila and uh, the other AI institutes in Canada. And one of the things I was very keen on is a part of the mission of our institute Mila, um, should be what I call AI for humanity. In other words, thinking about these uh, social questions, the social impact. And, um, and at about that time, uh, I started thinking about not just the negatives, right? So what can go wrong? but also the positives in the sense that um, there are all kinds of areas of potential application of AI uh, for which there is not much uh, investment by industry nor by governments, but that could really matter to us. For example, in healthcare or, you know, in climate change or education. And in healthcare, for example, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, infectious diseases like you know pandemics um, is an area where the pharmaceutical industry has not been like investing too much because it's not profitable. But if, but you can see how important it can be for society, you know, for the well-being of people um, to be well prepared scientifically with the right tools to face these challenges. Uh, and it costs a lot to the economy to not be prepared. Um, so uh, I hope that this this pandemic is helping governments understand the importance of investing in these AI for social good research, where we're not just trying to understand how to not use AI, but where to use it in areas that matter to society, where there is a need from, uh, you know, governments or philanthropy to invest. So, uh, climate is, is, of course, another big area that, that we are uh, working on at Mila, um, where because the current price of carbon is, is quite low around the world, there is not enough incentive for companies to do the kind of research that we need in order to build better batteries, uh, store energy, better uh, convert energy, uh, capture carbon, you know, whatever, or, uh, you know, use energy more efficiently in, in our buildings or whatever it is. Uh, so uh, these these are areas where eventually, hopefully, the price of carbon will be high enough to stimulate the industrial research that is needed. But in the meantime, I think governments have a self-interest if they are rational to to spend uh, more dollars on these things, more money on these things, um, so that we can quickly build the, the tools that we need to face the amazing challenges that humanity faces. I would say, I mean, besides the progress with large language models, which is impressive, but but, but not so technically exciting, as in there's a lot of engineering um, and not, you know, huge new ideas. As far as I'm concerned, you know, we don't know all the details, uh, but we have a pretty good understanding of what's going on there. Um, I think one of the things that impressed me uh, the most is the progress in uh, generative models. So generative models are like unsupervised learning methods, for example, that can generate images. So I was involved in this. Uh, in 2014, we uh, came up with uh, GANs, the uh, generative adversarial networks, which have had a very successful uh, run uh, with lots and lots of uh, follow-up work and applications. Uh, more recently, people have been focusing on these diffusion models, for example. Uh, they're extremely impressive. And actually, in my lab, even before GANs, we were working on similar things that based on denoising. Yeah. Um, so this, the, some of the ideas behind this really date back to uh, more than uh, 10 years ago. And um, 
So this is something that has always interested me, and I'm really impressed with the progress we've made recently. And it's, it's like technical advances. We, we're reusing some of the old ideas from 10, 15 years ago, but but there has also been some like real advances uh, in how to do this, um, and in particular uh, to scale it. Um, and the, some of the work that I'm doing currently is also a special kind of generative model, which allows to generate things that are not things like images, that are like high dimensional vectors, but instead things like thoughts, things that are like more like data structures that relate entities together in, in a semantic way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm quite excited by the progress um, that is happening in terms of, uh, if you want, probabilistic machine learning, um, you know, based on deep learning still, but with a lot of math of probability uh, under the hood to be able to address uh, some of the you know bigger big challenges that are still open. Another area that I'm very excited about that came up in the last few years, but really dates back to uh, almost a decade, uh, more than a decade, um, and that's the bringing ideas from causality, which is a field that's much older in statistics, econometrics, social sciences. Uh, uh, into machine learning. Uh, so groups like uh, the group of Bernard Shopkov in Germany have been pioneers in this um, uh, to uh, try to better understand the principles of causality that, and, and how they can be incorporated into some of the ideas we have in, in deep learning and machine learning and probabilistic machine learning. Um, and in the last two, three years, that has really picked up. Many more people, many workshops have been organized. I was part of that. And my group has been working on this since 2019. Uh, so that's another area which I think could be really transformative. And the reason is that one of the big limitations of current machine learning, including deep learning, is the ability to properly generalize to new settings, like new distributions, what we call out of distribution generalization. And humans are very good at that. And there is evidence that, uh, you know, there are good reasons to think that uh, humans are good at that because they have causal models of the world. And I'm not going to explain the theory of you know, causality, but if you have a good causal model, you can generalize to new settings that correspond to the same, think of it like the same laws of physics, but in different environments. So you might be in a completely new environment, but you know that the laws of physics are the same. And so you can kind of predict what's going to happen um, in spite of being in a completely novel place, if you want. Um, so so that's that's something that I, I find really fascinating and that motivates uh, a lot of my work. Okay, so first of all, I don't like the term AGI. It's It's a misnomer. Um, the original meaning of AGI means a completely general intelligence. Now people are using the term to mean something different, which for which I use a different term, which is human level intelligence. In other words, machines that have the same capacities intellectually as humans. Um, so I think human level intelligence is indeed where we want to go because, well, uh, we have the example of human intelligence and we'd like to build machines that are as smart as us to help us in many problems. So that's what motivates me. Now, is that an end goal? Well, it's hard to say. I think uh, if we understand the principles of intelligence that make us intelligent, we can probably go beyond human intelligence. Like think of like, you know, planes and birds. We, we understand now the physics of flight um, that of course birds exploit. And, but we don't build bird-like machines, we, bird, we build airplanes that can do things that birds cannot do. And by the way, birds can do things that airplanes cannot do. That's a little interesting parenthesis. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's too far to see, you know, at that stage, where, where, where do we want to go from there? So I think a guiding principle should be what's best for humanity, right? Where in what direction should we go? So I guess there are two things that here going on that motivate scientists. One is understanding what is intelligence, and the other is doing something useful. That's like what's good for humanity. 
Um, and presumably and hopefully we'll be like applying these two principles when we get there as well.